This is the Unit 3 focus session, so this is the source-based exam, Britain 1930 to about 1955. First of all, I'm going to go through the content and then the question types. So in key topic one, we covered the impact of the Great Depression and unemployment, the experiences of those who were unemployed, and there was the case study on Jarrow. So key ideas within this key topic. You have to be aware that the Wall Street crash causes this Great Depression and that Britain as a country wasn't affected equally. There was a divide between the old and the new industries. So old industries, we're talking about things like coal, and shipbuilding, iron and steel and textiles and these industries were badly affected. Some of them had been suffering since the 1920s but once the Wall Street crash hits um, and plunges the country into depression these older industries cannot compete and they begin to go under. Newer industries um, were much less badly affected things like the chemical industry, the aviation industry, the motor industry, um, electronics industry, things like manufacturing of radios. So there's a real divide depending on the industry and there's also a divide depending on um, location. So it's known as the north-south divide. So those areas of heavy unemployment, the northwest where we are located, South Wales around Merthyr Tydfil, um, Jarrow in the northeast, a band across uh, the middle of Scotland and Northern Ireland. These were where the old industries were located and there were you know, massive problems. Now, you need to be aware of how the government tried to deal with the problems. So, for example, the fall of the Labour government and the start of the um, uh, National Coalition government, public spending cuts, so 10% reduction of those um, who were employed by the government in their wages, the dole, the means test, so that um, test that was hated that saw how much you got to determine how much um, benefit you received, the Special Areas Act that attempted to attract the industries that were doing well to those areas of the country that were struggling and provided grants for that and um, the Unemployment Act that sort of formalised those arrangements to do with um, benefits. Okay, there were other policies as well that um, the government used like amalgamation, trying to join together those industries that weren't doing so well or the companies within those industries to make them more competitive. Um, they also um, tried to tackle this by um, you know, coming off the gold standard and passing the Import Duties Act which was meant to put a 10 to 20% duty on all imports. So you need to be aware of what the government was trying to do but that the government believed that these economic problems were cyclical, that the economy went in cycles and they didn't need to um, you know, spend a lot of money creating jobs because this was a natural cycle and there would be an improvement. But, you know, at its height, there's three million people out of work. You'd also need to be aware of the experiences of the unemployed, so the impact on living standards. Living standards obviously, you know, decline massively. The men who were unemployed are, you know, roaming around on the streets in huge numbers, don't have anything to do. It affects their mental well-being. Um, family life is affected badly, the women are often going without food, so that affects their diet, you know, plunge them to poverty. The children of those who are um, unemployed are more likely to have health problems and, um, you know, life, life is not good and um, there is a lack of awareness from those living in areas um, that aren't affected for what it really is like for those who are unemployed. Now, the, the biggest um, hatred that they felt was towards this means test when the um, you know, inspectors from the public assistant committees would come in and inspect what you had. And if you had um, items that could be sold, then they would have to be sold before you could receive your dole money. And the dole is the money you received after your um, unemployment benefit ran out. And that was what you were getting because of your contributions from your national insurance. So once that ran out, you went on to the dole. Um, and um, 
the dole money could be reduced if you had parents living with you or if you had children who were earning you know a, a part-time wage from a small job that they had um, it, it was embarrassing it was humiliating in um, Durham they refused to carry it out but in other areas it was you know carried out really you know quite strictly now the case study in this is Jarrow. Jarrow is near Newcastle up in the northeast and um, what happened in Jarrow was a hunger march. Now there have been lots of hunger marches in the country trying to persuade the government to you know, do more, act more, um, you know, deal with the issues, but Jarrow is the one you are expected to know about. Um, at the heart of all of this is the um, shipbuilding company in Jaro, which was very badly affected and you know most men in the town are unemployed so they decide that they're going to march to London to ask the government to create jobs. Now they want to do this independently, they don't want to do it in conjunction with the National Unemployed Workers Movement because um, that's been associated with communism and they want to do it independently from um, you know political parties in general now on the way down the marches are very well received you know they're, they're relying on charity on handouts on people feeding them putting them up for the night um, and you know they, they raise enough money to be able to do this on their march down the government response is very negative the Prime Minister's made it clear that he's not going to meet with them they hand over their petition and basically not a lot changes. Um, Stanley Baldwin was very unsympathetic and most of the men go home and many of them find that their um, dull money has been cut because they weren't available for um, work. Now balance that against experiences of those who lived in the Midlands and the South where living standards were increasing, you know, lots of people are buying their own houses, access to, you know, fridges and irons and, you know, indoor bathrooms, you know, cars. There's a real divide and lack of understanding from those who are not affected by the Great Depression to those who are Okay, key topic two is Britain at war. So you need to be aware of what happens when the Germans um, finally launch their Blitzkrieg, the, you know, the German invasion of the Netherlands, you know, Belgium and France. At the start of the war, when war is declared in September 1939, it's known as the Phony War because not a lot happens. But the invasion in the spring of 1940 changes everything. You need to be aware of the BEF going over to help the French and then being forced back because of these blitzkrieg tactics to Dunkirk. And that, you know, Dunkirk is, um, you know, is it a triumph, a success or is it a disaster? Essentially the BEF is evacuated from Dunkirk and um, just, you know, what, whilst this is going on, Churchill becomes Prime Minister and his really important role in portraying this as a success. Remember all the equipment that is left behind and um, the role of the ordinary um, men and boys in the boats who go over and help rescue the stranded men on the beach. We then get the Battle of Britain, which is the Nazi attempt to gain control of the skies of Britain, ready for Operation Sea Lion, which is the attempt to um, invade Britain. And that then merges into um, the Blitz, which we'll have a look at in Key Topic 3. And then finally within this is D-Day and the defeat of Germany. So you need to be aware of all those preparations, you know, launching all of the, the fake um, information about where the army camps were through Operation Fortitude. Then you need to be aware of um, the importance of the events of D-Day itself and the beaches and the different experiences and, you know, the important role of, you know, the Mulberry floating harbours and Pluto and all the planning that went into it. And then the attempt to speed things up, you know, by taking the bridges over the Rhine 
um, including Arnhem Bridge, Operation Market Garden, and how these things were hastily planned and didn't come off very well. And the final German attempt to push back the Allies at the Battle of the Bulge, where they do well initially, but then overstretch themselves. And then that final uh, defeat of Germany with the Soviets coming from the east, the Allies coming from the west and up through um, Italy and how the Germans run out of supplies and you know the role of the RAF in um, destroying infrastructure um, so that you know Germany is defeated. Key topic three includes the Blitz. So the Blitz is what emerges out of the German failure in the Battle of Britain when they start bombing London and they decide that they're going to try and defeat the British by destroying their morale. So you need to know about um, you know, reasons why the Blitz was launched, the effects of the Blitz on British towns and cities, so you know, the destruction, the damage that is caused, particularly on Coventry, for example, but also you know, Liverpool and Manchester and Portsmouth, and how you know, at the beginning um, you, there isn't a Blitz spirit. There's a lot of panic and um, people fleeing, and how... Um, that blitz spirit does eventually begin to emerge. The British have been planning for this. They have, you know, got air raid shelters built and they've got the home guard working and, um, you know, they instigate the blackout. Now, hand in hand with the blitz goes evacuation. Now, the first wave of evacuation was, you know, very well planned. It happens back in September 1939, you know, with the phony war when not a lot happens. You know, the blitz begins um, the, you know, late summer of 1940. But evacuation works very well. The children are evacuated safely out of the towns and cities. The problems usually start once they get to the towns and cities and there's mixed experiences that the children have as evacuees. And then there's the second blitz with the V1 and V2 bombs, the pilotless bombs and uh, you know, the doodle bugs and the noise they make and how their launch sites are overrun. And that's quite a crucial um, development because they can't do so much damage but you need to be aware that you know the morale of the people in Britain isn't um, destroyed. You have to be aware of the role of the government so during the war the government has you know extraordinary powers to um, to run the country in the way that will allow them to fight the war. So they've got powers of you know, censorship and propaganda with the Ministry of Information they're able to set up um, rationing and um, control food supplies to, you know, to try and get around the you know inequality in the country. Um, they're issuing information on all sorts of things but everything is censored, the newspapers, the um, radio and it's all about keeping morale up and Churchill is obviously at the heart of all of this with his no-nonsense attitude, you know, no discussion of, um, of giving in. And finally, the role of women. So you need to be aware of the contribution that the women made, all the different forms of employment, including in the armed forces, heavy industry and transport, um, and how these changes you know, last long term. Essentially, they don't. They, they begin to change attitudes, but if you look at the number of women who are in work at the, you know, after the Second World War, the, the numbers are very, very similarly similar to before the war. Many women just go back to their previous jobs. And finally, key topic four: the first part is um, Labour winning the general election in 1945 um, because of their, you know, looking to the future, their um, their role in the election campaign. Where they're going to build a better future? They're going to put in place all the reforms that Beveridge has suggested, that they've, the, the population have seen wartime socialism in action, they're not so scared of these ideas anymore. Then the second section is the Beveridge report, so it's the five giants. It's, you know, want ignorance, squalor, disease and idleness and how they're going to deal with them and pass laws to deal with these issues to bring about a minimum standard of living. So you need to know about, you know, dealing with want, you know, the introduction of um, family allowances, the impact of the National Insurance Act, which brought, you know, most workers um, within it 
and the National Assistance Act, which mocked up anybody who wasn't included by national insurance. Um, then, you know, the changes in education with the 11 plus, the introduction of the NHS, the house building um, schemes, and how all of these measures were designed to ensure a minimum standard of living. Um, and then finally, you've got the um, introduction of the NHS. So you need to be aware of the impact of the National Health Service, the opposition from the BMA and the doctors who were worried about being controlled by the government and becoming civil servants. And then, you know, the introduction of the NHS itself, you know, was it exploited or not? Or had a lot of these people been living with long-term medical conditions that hadn't been seen to? And then overall, you know, evaluating the impact of the NHS when they, you know, they, they do have to introduce charges for some people for prescriptions and um, certain, um, certain um, benefits that they were getting. Okay, so there's the four key topics. Right, this is just going through all those key ideas that you should be aware of. Now remember that your exam will focus on just one of these issues. Now question types, the first one is going to be what can you learn from source A about, and this is your inference question, so you must remember that you need to start source A suggests that. I can tell this because it says and provide a supporting quote. You need to do this twice to get full marks. Remember, you can't use the wording in the source to make an inference. Okay, question two is going to be what was the purpose of the representation? So you need to follow this structure. So source X has been designed to portray the, whatever it is in the question, as. So you're looking at the portrayal because it's a representation. Then you've got to state what the purpose is. So the purpose of this is to encourage people to go and vote or to, you know, whatever it is. It's usually going to be an action that you take after reading it or looking at it or listening to it. It's not going to be just to inform or to show you. Now, the most important bit once you've identified the purpose is this next section so it achieves its purpose by giving the message that and you've got to pick out several examples from the representation how it's going to achieve its purpose so you've got to think about what the author or artist has deliberately chosen to do or chosen to focus on and what impression that is creating look at the words that are used look at the font or the color or the type or how the people in the image have been arranged. Everything within that representation will have been done on purpose because they're trying to get you to do something, you know, um, to achieve the overall purpose. And then the final section of your answer, you have got to include some own knowledge. So that's own knowledge about, you know, the topic in general. It might be the blitz, it might be evacuation, it might be rationing, whatever it is, you have got to say, I know at the time of this representation, and you've got to bring in, you know, three or four sentences of your own knowledge. Okay, question three is your explain why question. So it's going to say, explain why something happened, and you've got to use the source and your own knowledge. And you've got to do this twice. So here's the structure. The source suggests that one reason is, I can tell this because it says they're looking for a direct quote or reference to something you can see in the image. You know, this is giving the impression, or this is suggesting that, and in relation to this reason, I know that, and bring in some own knowledge. Now, for the second reason, if you can find one in the source, excellent, go with that. If not, then you can just use your own knowledge, but you've got to have two reasons. Question four, you're going to get asked how reliable two sources are. And for each source, you need to deal with the contents and then their knob. So for the content section, you need to say, you know, the contents of source X, whatever it is, seem reliable as evidence of whatever it is in the question. This is because it states we need some direct quotes and I know. So you are comparing what it says in the source to your own knowledge. But then you've also got to look at 
what it might state that disagrees with your own knowledge or ways in which it doesn't provide a full picture. So the contents section, you're comparing the contents of the source and you're giving specific examples to your own knowledge. And then your second section is nature, origin and purpose. So you've got to judge the reliability based on its not. And again, it needs to be evaluative. So these aspects of its not lead you to think it's reliable, but these ones suggest it's not so reliable. And again,